Hi, I'm Bryce Crittenden. Hi, I'm Caroline Land, and welcome back to EPL's Overdue Finds. Caroline, how are you today? I'm doing really well. Super excited about today's topic. Yeah, I. Uh, it's funny because this today's topic. I mean, we will share it. You've probably seen <laughs> what the topic it. is. You've read yeah. it because you've downloaded <laughs> this. Um, today, of course, we are talking about K-pop, and this is an episode that we've had. Like we have, we've talked about this before on the show, Caroline, where we've got this list of episode ideas, and we come around to them every every quarter or so, and we're like, okay, well, what do we want to what do we want to talk about? And um, yeah, this is one that it's always on the list. And finally, we're here to talk about it. Um, I'm a little nervous. Well, I, I shouldn't say I'm nervous. Like this is obviously something I don't think it'll be a big shock to people to know that I know virtually nothing about K-pop. But uh, I think we're gonna, still going to have fun chatting about it today, right? Oh, yeah. I'm really looking forward to this. There was a moment. So I think uh, a couple March Madnesses. Is that the plural of March Madness? March Madnesses ago? Maybe. Um, uh, I don't think it's March's Madness. So that's no. what I'm con- <laughs> I'm confident about that one. Anyway, yeah. I digress. The um, uh, I think it was the best of the 2010s. And we had BTS and one of the matchups. And... We, the single highest vote getter of any contest. Yeah. So that one's really interesting for a couple of reasons. One, uh, so that vote actually happened on March 4th, 2020. Ooh. So we are just like getting into COVID here. And that we was also so the, innocent. We, we were, were, we, we were, we were so all... <laughs> much, so much younger at the time. <laughs> That was also the day that we were in studio recording our Tanya Talaga interview as well. Right, right. Because my... your phone kept like, like just it was like blowing drop. up. Because <laughs> uh, yes, because there were the, like Twitter itself, but then the rest of the marketing team going, "Are you seeing this?" <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. So the matchup on Twitter, so it was our best of 2010s tournament. And uh, so the matchup in the first round was BTS versus Ed Sheeran. So we behind the scenes are like, oh yeah, this is probably going to be a really, really close one because both are obviously really popular. Well, uh, I think we just used the hashtag BTS and their fans got a hold of it and just absolutely decimated poor ed sheeran so it wasn't even close so i br- i found the actual twitter results here of, of the poll that we ran that day and bts beat ed sheeran by a score of six thousand five hundred and five to 133 they absolutely walked away with it i kind of thought that this was going to be bts's tournament to win and uh, they got a hold of the fans got a hold of that one <laughs> the first round matchup but after that it was just kind of like everybody else was voting and uh they i don't remember how far they went they unfortunately didn't win but we, it obviously made us think like hey we clearly need to be doing a k-pop episode of overdue fines absolutely and we had some uh some past guests of the show uh reach out and say when you do a k-pop episode because you will be doing one i want in and so we're we're so excited to have have two uh guests today who luckily know more about the topic than we do oh absolutely yeah these uh a couple of our guests today like you said it was kind of like I think we'd have to go into hiding if we recorded this episode and didn't invite our two guests today. So first, I want to welcome back to the show, a uh, friend of the show. Uh, she's a discovery and cataloging library librarian here at EPL, uh, Carol Ma. Carol, welcome back to the show. How are you today? I'm good. It's great to be back. I'm so excited to talk about K-pop, one of the many loves of my life. So <laughs> I am excited. I think the last episode you were on might have been Harry Potter, where we were talking about the movie. Yes. So I've done two episodes of Overdue Finds that have touched on Harry Potter. And I <laughs> wonder if today it'll come up again. I It's not in my notes for it to come up, but there <laughs> is a K-pop song called Mr. Potter. 
Oh, about Harry or a different Mr. Potter? I think it's a it's a reference to Harry Potter, but I'm oh, not sure. Okay. And also, we want to welcome uh, back to the show. Uh, she's a library assistant for our EPL to go literacy vans, and uh, of course, overdue finds family member and uh, all those. Uh, some of those awesome uh, show notes you take a look at after listening to an episode of of overdue finds this guest is uh responsible for some of those so please welcome back to the show maria milanowski maria how are you today i'm good thanks thanks for having me back yeah i'm excited to be here and i do have to say i'm sorry i couldn't not say this about the march madness <laughs> season where bts almost took over because their fans got over on social media. I told you that was going to happen. <laughs> you did. You yes. did. Uh, you you previously were on the show. I, I believe that was that um, the preview episode for yes. that March Madness. And in the media, yeah, no, you totally, totally did. I think you were like, yeah, if their fans get a hold of it, this thing is over. I'm like, sure, Maria, sure. And uh, sure enough, I mean, yeah, if they had got, got on, a, if they had caught on to a few more rounds there, they absolutely would have won. So uh, yeah, I can't, I'm so happy that both of you are joining us today because uh, as, as Caroline mentioned, not really, uh, uh, we're, this isn't our expertise topic. So uh, we're so happy uh, we're going to get to learn all about K-pop today. And uh, But before we get into that, let's talk about our recent overdue finds picks. Uh, Carol, is there a recent title that you've enjoyed that uh, you can recommend to listeners? Mine is a double recommendation, and I hope that's okay. And it's a podcast that ties into a book we have in our collection. So the podcast is produced by Vice, and it's called Authentic, the Story of Tableau. Um, Tableau is a Korean-Canadian rapper. He's also the frontman of the K-hip-hop trio uh, called Epic High. I've been a fan of Epic High's music for over a decade. I'm wearing one of their sweaters right now. The podcast is not about the music. So the podcast is about Tableau, who was a victim of a disinformation campaign in the early 2010s, where hundreds of thousands of people were convinced that his Ivy League credentials were fraudulent. Um, and this led to this online witch hunt against him and his family. It spans continents. At some point, Interpol tries to get involved. It's it's like a crazy story. So this podcast has 10 episodes. It's a really great look into internet culture, conspiracy theories, disinformation, a little bit of true crime as well. And the book tie-in is called Pieces of You. And we have a few copies kicking around at EPL. It's a collection of short stories that Tableau wrote from 1998 to 2001 when he was a college student at Stanford. Um, and I wanted to recommend this because it was a bestseller in Korea when it was published. And it was one of the reasons why everyone was so focused on Tableau when this controversy hit because he was successful in his music, he was successful in his writing and a lot of People online thought, you know, this is too good to be true. There's no way this guy is real. He must be lying about something. Um, so that kind of led to this whole witch hunt. Um, and that's my second re recommendation, Pieces of You by Tableau. The, that sounds really interesting. I, uh, I'll be honest, I have not have not heard of Tableau before, but the story sounds, you know, really intriguing, especially to with you know in our day and age with misinformation. Uh, we recently, for our forward thinking speaker series, had uh, Timothy Caulfield uh, talking about obviously misinformation around COVID and everything, and um, obviously with all that's been going on with that. Um, you know, misinformation sadly is not going away. And we're also seeing some stuff like that right now too, obviously with uh, the conflict in, in Ukraine. So um, yeah, that sounds like a really, really interesting uh, listen for the, obviously the podcast and the book and definitely something I'm going to add to my list once, once we're done recording here. Uh, Maria, how about you? What have you been enjoying lately? So I have another double recommendation, <laughs> sure. well, which I hope is okay, it. because one of the items isn't in the EPL catalog because it's a podcast. So I was like, well, I'll tie it in too. Um, so a podcast that I've been really, really enjoying for the past couple of years actually is called D&D &D &D, or Dinner and Dungeons and Dragons. 
And it is something that I got into because I was a fan of this group of friends that uh, records the podcast before they started doing the podcast. So they were on YouTube as a group called Practical Folks, and they did comedy sketches, and they did a series called Drunk Disney, where they would watch Disney movies and do a specific drinking game to each one. And so they are just very talented improvisers, and their dynamic as a friend group is really wonderful. So when they started doing a D&D &D or D &D podcast, sorry, that extra D sneaks in there, I initially didn't know anything about the topic, and it didn't interest me, but it got to the point where I was like, well, I like this group of people. I like what they put out. Let's try their podcast. And now I am totally hooked on it. And now I also play D&D with some of my coworkers. So that was my kind of gateway into the story. It's very funny. Um, it's a homebrew campaign. So James Grussell, the Dungeon Master, has created this incredible universe for them to play in. And there's a huge ongoing story arc that they're traveling through. Um, the characters are very funny and very lovable, and it's just a pleasure to listen to. So that's the first one. Mm -hmm. And then the other book I wanted to shout out, this was a recommendation by Cassidy, Cassidy Monroe, who is another EPL friend. Um, she told me about a book that's called Starfish by Lisa Phipps. And this one is about a young girl who is overweight and is written in kind of free verse poetry and just kind of explains the things that she goes through in her life and is a really honest, but also uplifting story. And it's a really wonderful read. So it's a middle grade novel. We did our, of course, we did a Dungeons and Dragons episode of the podcast. And uh, like myself, Caroline and I, we weren't really familiar with it. And uh, Overdue Finds family member, Meg DeForest kind of walked us through what it is and, and setting up your character and all that stuff. So I, I think it's really cool to hear. And I've heard a couple of, about a couple of other podcasts and some books also from people who you know run these weekly uh, Dungeons and Dragons games and uh, you know they've recorded podcasts about it or do uh, shows on YouTube with it so it's really cool that people get like so involved in it and then also people will you know take their time to watch you know this group of friends you know uh, uh, play d and I think that's I think that's really cool yeah so I have to ask, like, how often do you play with uh, with some some of our coworkers here at EPL? We're, we've been trying to do about once a month, so nice. we're a couple of a couple of games deep into our campaign, and we're growing into our own with our ridiculous characters, and it's been a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> nice, uh, Caroline. Do you have a double pick this week? I just picked one, but uh, <laughs> maybe we'll see uh, how it goes. As it also, Maria, I had to laugh when you said, "Like, I hope it's okay to have two. You, you do the, you do the list. You know that, like, we <laughs> regularly recommend one thing by talking about another thing. So, um, uh, yeah, mine uh, was actually a book that I think came up during our book talk episode uh, about books that are uh, have kind of a following um, or a presence on. TikTok. It uh, is Verity by Colleen Hoover. And this is another one of my twisty thrillers. Um, this one is about uh, a young uh, writer, Lowen Ashley, who's hired by Jeremy Crawford to finish his wife Verity's book series. It's kind of a mysterious circumstance. Why would Verity need someone to finish out her book series? Well, it turns out Verity is in a secret coma following a terrible car accident. Tragedy has just gripped the Crawford family. Their, the deaths of their children, um, the Verity's accident, just all kinds of horrible things has happened. And so Lowen Ashley, who is basically broke, decides, yes, I'm going to take this job, become this new co-writer of this. But in order to do so, I'm going to have to see the notes. So she goes up to their cottage estate kind of gothic e new england style and starts reading through verity's notes that are in her office then one day she comes across an unpublished uh autobiography that verity has written detailing her life and her inner thoughts and it turns out she's not the person that her husband thought she was so now lowen's trying to decide what to do but complicating this is the fact that she is falling in love with Jeremy. So 
what's she going to do? How is she going to manage this? And is someone a secret killer all along? I read this book in a day. It was like, I couldn't put it down. <laughs> so many twists and turns there. Wow. There were. And like, even when I thought we were done twisting, there were a couple more. So um, <laughs> there are, it uh, was the kind of, I sometimes wanted to throw it across the room. I sometimes wanted to, um, you know, just pick it up and keep reading. It was, it was a journey. So wow. I look forward to hearing what other people thought of this book if you if they've read it. Is uh, is that a fairly new book then? I thought it was newer than it was. I think it's a couple years now, maybe 2018, 19, 20. What is time, right? Yeah. So uh, I think it's a couple years. She also has Colleen Hoover has a number of other books i think some of them are quite different in style um but uh definitely uh an author who tries to keep you on your toes so wow yeah sounds really good and i kind of had to chuckle a little bit because you mentioned that it's set in like new england there's something about like new england and the setting have being almost like the perfect setting for some of these like thrillers and, and mysteries and everything um so yeah, I could kind of, as you're explaining it to me, picture, picture the setting in my head anyway. Yeah, it, uh, it is. She moves I, from New York to this kind of quieter, it's, I'm, tr I'm remembering, I don't think they describe it as a cottage, or if they do, it's one of those cottages that's actually like a mansion, um, <laughs> because there's so many, like there's all these multiple bedrooms, there's also, you know, they have a, a nurse who comes in and she's suspicious of Lowen, because, well, who knows why, maybe Lowen will figure it out, so uh, there's all these things happening in the book. Wow. Yeah. Right. Sounds, sounds great. Well, what it, have <laughs> have you been enjoying anything as twisty as that? Not really, no. Um, so my recommendation this week, um, I've talked about this on the show before. We've done a whole episode on sports movies. And uh, baseball season, when you hear this, is just starting up. Thankfully, they avoided a work stoppage. The Blue Jays are looking like a World Series contender this year, which is awesome. So I was just kind of thinking back to some of my favorite baseball movies. And a friend of mine sent me kind of uh, this uh, link on Instagram, and it made me think of one of my favorite baseball movies that I l absolutely loved as a kid. And that's uh, the movie Rookie of the Year. It came out in 1993. And this is something where if like we were just doing like a March Madness of 90s movies i totally would have fought for this one to be included in there so this is one that i think most 90 kids 90s kids have watched at least once growing up uh so the movie itself uh, stars thomas ian nicholas uh most people probably maybe remember him as one of the friends in the american pie movies uh, he plays Henry Rowengartner, who's just kind of like this average 12, 13 year old kid. But uh, he gets into uh, this uh, accident and hurts his arm. Now, after he hurts his arm, it somehow miraculously gives him an incredibly powerful pitching arm. So he, of course, gets scouted by the Chicago Cubs. Chicago Cubs are trailing in the standings. So they're like, hey, what would be better to help boost attendance and get back into the hunt for the World Series by signing a, you know, a 13-year-old pitching prodigy? So that's exactly what they do. Um, yeah, the movie also stars Gary Busey and Daniel Stern. Uh, Daniel Stern, of course, uh, from, like, from the Home Alone movies. And Daniel Stern actually directed this movie. You see some uh, great 90s baseball players in there, like one of my personal favorites, Ken Griffey Jr., who strikes out uh, thanks to Henry Rowan Gardner's awesome pitching. Uh, this is just a fun movie overall, and I think um, – yeah, if you, if it's been a while since you've watched it, um, I think you know, especially if you if you have a family, the kids will enjoy it. You'll enjoy it too. Going back and having an absolute blast watching this movie. So yeah, that's my overdue fine pick this week. If I can say, I loved that movie when I was a kid. We would get it from the library all the time, and me and my sisters had no interest in baseball whatsoever, but we would get that movie all the time because it's wonderful. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, no, it's like I said, it's just it's just a fun movie. And it's funny because like in the 90s, we had this really big wave of like great baseball movies. Like this one came out and we had the Sandlot, which I've talked about on the show before. Um, the major Angels. league movies. Angels in the outfield. Angels in the outfield, yeah. Tony Danza on the big screen. That was awesome. So um, yeah, what was the other one I was just thinking of too? Um forgot the name of it but it anyway better have been a league of their own because that uh yes league of their own is my favorite baseball movie <laughs> clearly we could have had a 90s baseball movies bracket like as its own category in our march madness tournament this year i think i think so i think uh or uh, as a very niche podcast topic yes definitely yeah. <laughs> uh so of course let's get to why we're here today we're talking all about K-pop. Uh, if you're not as familiar with it as myself and Caroline are, I think you're going to really enjoy today's discussion. Um, so I guess I, I'm just going to start because, um, you know, Carol, how were you first introduced to, uh, to K-pop? Let me set the scene for you. It was probably 2005. Um, the radio was playing songs like We Belong Together, Hollaback Girl, Mr. Brightside came out that year. Um, and these are all great songs and I love them now, but back then I was just really tired of what was playing on the radio and streaming services weren't a thing that yet. So I just wanted something different. Um, so one day during my lunch break, my friend sat me down and gave me one ear bud, earphone to her Sony Walkman MP3 player. Uh, and she showed me Rising Sun by TVXQ. And Maria's already laughing. Like It's such a classic song. I was just floored. It's so catchy. It's so different from anything I had ever heard. So I went home. I started to research online, like the little librarian that I am. Um, and I found Soupy, which is an English language website that covers Korean culture. Um, and I just started to participate in online forums. Um, and I discovered a lot of other Korean music artists like Super Junior, uh, Klazakwai, Epic High, which I mentioned in my Overdue Finds recommendation. Uh, that's just kind of how I started. It was all in 2005. Nice. It's it's funny. You, It's really interesting because if you think of the year 2005, and like you said, you're getting really tired of hearing the same stuff played on the radio. It was kind of a really weird time because, like you said, there was no like there was no Spotify then. Uh, this is also probably a couple of years before YouTube uh, officially launched and music videos were kind of like kind of out the door already. So uh, yeah, it was kind of, you know, unless you were, uh, you know, like you said, maybe into some online forums, it might've been hard to discover uh, new artists that weren't as mainstream during that time. Mm -hmm, definitely. Maria, how about you? Like, how did, how did you uh, get interested in it? I also have a very specific story about how I was introduced to K-pop music. So shout out to my friend Emily in grade 10, right before we were supposed to be taking our finals. She introduced me to a song called G by Girls' Generation, which was like the most popular song of that entire year, probably. She showed me the music video and it's customary for most K-pop singles to be released with a dance, like a prepackaged dance. So when these artists perform the song on stage, they will be doing set choreography to these songs. She showed me the music video and told me, I bet you can't learn that. And I was like, oh yeah, let's see. And so instead of studying for my French final, <laughs> I learned the dance to G off of the music video and just thought, this is a lot of fun. This is a great time. And so from there, I went down the rabbit hole, which already existed on YouTube of finding other artists and got really into Shiny and got really into Girls' Generation and backtracked and learned about all of the artists that Carol just talked about. And it was over from that point. <laughs> can you still do that dance? Absolutely, I can. <laughs> That's like long-term memory, muscle memory now at this point. I've stayed a K-pop fan for a long time. I used to teach dance drop-ins. And so... I've taught that song a couple of times and it's just in my brain forever at this point. 
Is that still a thing though with most songs when they're released? Like, is there dances uh, specifically for those songs? Yeah, absolutely. I actually, my older sister works at a school and their junior high had a wellness day. And so yesterday I was teaching a song by twice to a bunch of grades six, seven, and eights. So that was super fun. <laughs> I need nice. to ask what song was it? The Feels. <laughs> Oh, that is really fun. There were three groups of them, and it was girls and boys and anyone who identified anyway. Out of the three groups, two of them chose to learn the feels, which made me very happy. <laughs> K-pop is obviously very, very popular, but not everybody, it's, I don't think, like, not everybody listens to it or as, is as familiar with, like, the artists and the, and the songs as maybe they are some more of the mainstream stuff, I would say. Uh, so I guess, like, what's everybody's reaction when they uh, find out that you're a K-pop fan? For me, most people are not surprised that I listen to K-pop. It is pretty normal to be a K-pop fan if you're part of this, uh, the Asian diasporic community. A lot of us are straddling two or more different cultures. We don't really fit into one group, so we've just made our own culture based off of shared experiences. Uh, if you're on Facebook, if you've ever heard of the, the Facebook group Subtle Asian Traits, K-pop is all over that. It's because we have these shared experiences growing up in different cultures. It includes listening to K-pop, watching anime, spending way too much money on bubble tea. Um, these are all things that um, I guess people in my demographic and in my age range are experiencing and are embracing now because we realize we're not alone in this. People are more surprised on my end. <laughs> I think understandably, <laughs> I am Polish Canadian. So it's a little bit unexpected. And even when I was growing up, my sisters would ask me, why are you listening to music that you don't understand? Because I do not speak Korean. I can pick up like a couple words that show up in almost every single K-pop song, but you don't have to understand a language to enjoy the music that comes from that culture, right? Mm -hmm. And so I really found a way to connect with K-pop music through dancing and through finding other people in the community that enjoyed the music, enjoyed dancing, maybe also didn't necessarily speak Korean or were Korean or Korean Canadian, and just found a lot of joy and fun in being able to participate in that community. I love that both of your stories had a friend involved of like introducing it to you. That's kind of this hybrid of, um, you know, the internet connected, but also almost underground, like here, listen to this style um, of it. I love that. But also, yeah, I just, I just think that, I loved hearing both of your stories. Thank you, is what I'm trying to say. Um, many people, when they think of K-pop, might think of some of the more mainstream artists like BTS or Blackpink. Um, aside from what those groups are, are putting out there, what do you think the public needs to know about K-pop? Or what, 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 what should Bryce and I know about K-pop? I think it's interesting how quickly you can kind of get dragged down the rabbit hole of being interested in it not only because the youtube algorithm will be like oh you clicked on one k-pop thing get ready <laughs> it's coming all of your recommendations are going to get flooded but it's very carefully crafted so that you are enticed by this incredible like sound production and like visual production of the music videos everything is super duper like high quality really easy to consume and i think that's how they kind of catch everyone's attention um even if you don't understand what is being said in the songs they are oftentimes like very fun or very like energizing to listen to and again i think that's why it's so easy to kind of get sucked into this world because there are so many different avenues that you can take to become invested. So if you're interested in fashion, all of the fashion is like incredibly cool and they are very carefully crafted with the way that they present the musicians or the idols in their groups. Almost everyone has to be a phenomenal dancer. Everyone's like beautiful. Like it's just very interesting. You're looking at like the best possible production quality of a like of a piece of music that you could be looking at. So looking at or listening to. So it's easy to get sucked in, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And I agree with that. I really think K-pop is a very visual type of media. 
um, and that doesn't translate as well in, I think, Western music. You don't, you're not watching the music videos um, as frequently. But for me, I think what the public needs to know is that the term K-pop is really nebulous. Um, and I am going to put on my cataloging librarian hat and talk a little bit about this. Please. Um, it's, this is just so fascinating to me. So currently, um, we have controlled vocabularies. And part of my job is to describe materials using the set vocabulary. At EPL and a lot of other libraries, we use the Library of Congress, which is controlled by the Library of Congress in the United States. And they have a subject heading right now for popular music, Korea South. And a couple of years back, somebody submitted a proposal to the Library of Congress to add K-pop as a subject heading or as a used for reference, like a cross-reference, and it got denied because K-pop is so expansive and it covers so many genres and there's no real, uh, there's no specific attributes that distinguish it from other types of music. You could say, oh, it's, it's in Korean or it's made by people in Korea, but that's not true because you have artists like Lisa from Blackpink, who's not Korean, but is active in Korea, but is releasing songs in English, uh, but it's considered K-pop still um, by some people. So there's no real consensus as to what K-pop is. Um, all this to say that K-pop covers so many different genres and it defies a lot of expectations. So there really is something for everyone and every taste. Interesting. It's uh, that's why I love having librarians on the show because learn about cataloging and not not something you would typically get on on most podcasts. No, and and it really was like I was I was really tempted to like have one of the questions that we were going to talk about today be like so what is K-pop you know and and like are are there um, certain commonalities of it like to distinguish between K-pop and another style i don't i don't know i'm gonna i'll put it to you uh put you on the spot here what is k-pop i feel like once you get to know some of the idol groups that are active in k-pop and start listening to some of the different stuff that's out there you learn about how these groups are formed as well so like like girl group boy group culture still huge in korea and it's typical for the people who want to become musical artists to audition for these big production companies. And the production companies will very purposefully select people and form these groups like for them. And that's how you become a K-pop idol. And then your activities and the music that you put out and the dances that you put out are very like strictly controlled by these big production companies. So it seems like it's very intentional on a marketing perspective. And that kind of has influenced the way that I understand K-pop music because everything is so carefully like packaged and presented to the public. It seems like a very different way than how we produce music in even like North America. You use the phrase K-pop uh, idol and mm. that, is a, that is a specific term, right? Yeah, so that's what you would call, that's what the public would call these musical artists. Interesting. It really says something about the image that they need to upkeep and the way that the public expects them to behave as well. Kind of sounds a little bit obviously like, you know, I think back to the 90s with, you know, groups like New Kids on the Block or Sync and Backstreet Boys. And these are also two, it sounds like very similar in a way where it's like these record labels like put put these kids together or these guys together and package them and are responsible for the marketing and, you know, how they look and, and dress and everything. Um, I'm not sure if it was as um, extensive in the nineties as it, as it is today, but um, yeah, it sounds very, very similar to that in a way. Yeah. I think an interesting note, Bryce, for you to, you know, uh, recall groups uh, like NSYNC and um, groups that were active in the States um, and to make that connection with K-pop. So the person who kind of created this formula of boy groups and girl groups and really manufacturing it, he 
was one of the heads of one of the biggest K-pop production companies, SM Entertainment. And he was drawn um, and inspired by Motown. And that I think explains a lot. Yeah, I think back to like Jackson 5, obviously that's a family. So they weren't just, you know, five kids randomly brought together. But yeah, that's that's an interesting way to look at it. It's been, new, it's been going on for, like you said, especially back to the Motown days of like the 50s and 60s and everything. So it's been, it's been going on for a while now. Uh, so I have to ask, like, uh, we talked a little bit about, you know, the, the boy bands of the nineties, a little bit kind of comparing them, but like how has K-pop changed since, you know, you've started listening to it in the, sounds like the early two thousands. For me, so much has changed and we've been talking about YouTube and I'm going to keep going with that. I think the biggest thing is that it's everywhere now, because when I started listening to K-pop in 2005, it was a niche musical taste. And now you know, I can watch a Blackpink documentary on Netflix when back in the day I would have to root around on YouTube for, you know, a video in 144p and then open it and hope that there were English subtitles because there usually weren't. Um, and that is the biggest change. It's just, it's so accessible now. Um, but with that accessibility and with that global reach, I think the influence of K-pop has also changed because it's really cool for me to see an increase of Asian rep Asian representation in Western music with groups like BTS and Blackpink playing some of the biggest stages in the world. Um, and it's just so exciting to see faces that look like mine uh, because I didn't have that growing up. And, you know, if I told 2005 Carol that this is what was going to happen, um, I wouldn't have believed myself because it's, it's taken the world by storm in such a short amount of time. Yeah, it can't be understated how exciting it was to hear a K-pop song on the radio even like four or five years ago. This was something that would happen amongst me and my friends that would do K-pop dances together. If one of us was listening to the radio and a BTS song happened to be on there, we would text each other excitedly to say, oh my God, they're playing it on the radio. And it was a huge deal. So K-pop has had its uh, different like musical trends, just like the rest of the world has, but it's really evolved into something that has become so accessible across the world. And that's very, very exciting. And the dances have gotten a lot harder. <laughs> <laughs> if either of you told like 2005 you that uh, there would be a, a K-pop tie-in with McDonald's, would you have believed that? The collab from last year. Yeah. <laughs> I would believe it, but I would think it's like a Asian markets only thing. Like I wouldn't think it would reach Canada and the U.S. and global, um, globally. So, yeah. Here's my thing, and and I don't. I, I this this is probably going to get cut out. So the BTS meal, it was about chicken nuggets, right? And the I did not. It was a ten piece nugget. Here was what I thought. Oh, Carol has oh, got the BTS cup. Nice. Carol okay. has the cup. This is amazing. <laughs> so it was for ten piece nuggets. And don't get me wrong. I love. Like I'll go for ten piece. But I thought they could have done the six piece nugget with a bonus seven piece nugget. They could have made it like a, like a special seven piece nugget meal in addition to the special sauces that they had with the meal. So I, 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 I don't know, maybe there was something specific about the 10. I, I, I don't know, but I just wondered, I just thought because seven is, if you see seven, um, like in someone's Twitter handle, it often means that they are a fan of BTS. I don't know. So, yeah. Anyway, you were that... just missing your marketing prowess, Caroline. That's, that's <laughs> yeah. all that happened there. Or I spend a lot of time thinking about McDonald's. So... I mean, chicken McNuggets are good. By the way, McDonald's is not a sponsor of Overdue Finds. Um, they are. Contact us if you're interested, McDonald's. Send us an um, email. But yeah, it's um, <laughs> it's funny. I never even thought about that. Like the whole the whole seven thing. I'm guessing this is me putting on my 
marketing hat or not marketing hat, but thinking of like my logistical hat, it's probably somebody within inventory is like, no, seven will be too confusing. Like they'll think it's like a order of six and people will miss out on it. And that that's my guess. It's not an even number. So it uh, kind of got kiboshed that way. Yeah, I did like how they would break down the commercial so that every each member of the group had their own line that they would say. You both shared your stories of how you got uh, into it. What recommendations would you have for a first time listener, someone maybe trying to get a gateway into K-pop? Where should they look? So one of the artists that I think has an impeccable discography, they are called Shiny. Um, they have been around for a long time, so their older stuff will sound a bit more dated, but they are wonderful dancers. They're great musicians. When Maria was telling the story about hearing a song before uh, finals in high school, I immediately thought of Shiny because they have a song called Ring Ding Dong. Uh, Ring Ding Dong is banned in Korea during finals week because it's so catchy that students will um, do very poorly on tests after, you know, months of studying. If they hear the song on their way to school or to the testing facility, they will forget everything and all they can think of is Ring Ding Dong because it's so catchy. So I highly recommend Shiny. Um, and there's a few other groups. Again, it does it does depend on what your tastes are. If you like really hard hitting hype music, I would recommend Stray Kids. They're a newer group. Um, I haven't heard too many of their songs, but I do like what I'm hearing. And then if you like something lighter, Twice is a really fun group. They have really catchy dances. Um, as Maria was talking about earlier, it's really easy. It's really accessible to teach to kids, to teach to yourself. Um, it just feels good. I like that. I I think that's where I'm going to start after this. I don't know. The idea of having like such a strong ear presence in my head with Ring Ding Dong, I don't. I don't know. I'm a little nervous, but it's kind of like a challenge now. I know. I'm. <laughs> I absolutely have to check that one out once we're done recording here. <laughs> Maria, how about you? What would do? What would you suggest? Shiny also has a special place in my heart. So Carol and I are on the same level here. Um, their very first song, so their debut song, was called "Replay," and it remains to be one of my favorite K-pop songs ever. It's lovely. It's got this like R&B feel to it. And it's great. And the dance holds up because it is super duper fun to do. This is a situation where if you've listened to enough K-pop music, if a particular person like asked me, oh, what should I listen to? I feel like I could just like curate a playlist for them. <laughs> I do remember that Edmonton Public and Calgary Public Library used to do a annual like soccer game. So we would meet midway. We would drive down to Red Deer and they would drive up to Red Deer and we would have a soccer game every year. And one year, me and my friend Neil, who also works at the library, were driving in my car. So I said, I get to control the music. And I made him listen to K-pop with me the entire way. <laughs> and if you're a fan of like hip hop or rap, then he really enjoyed listening to 4 Minute, which was a girl group who had a more like hard hitting style, which is fun. But now also, I think that like Blackpink has a lot of just like bangers if you're a fan of that kind of music. BTS is obviously super accessible. If you need an idea of what to listen to for K-pop music, I'm pretty sure you can hit me up and I will just send you a bunch of things to listen to. <laughs> well, Maria gets our uh, podcast email. So uh, if you do need any K-pop recommendations, email us at podcast at epl.ca. Maria will send Personal you Personal picks K-pop edition for you. Yep. <laughs> Maria, you, you've said that uh, if you know someone and know some of their tastes, uh, at the risk of making this kind of personal, I was wondering if if you knew a little bit about me and Bryce, would you be able to maybe give us some recommendations? Caroline, I will do our best. Caroline, do you okay. want to tell us like some of your favorite artists, maybe? Yes, I, uh, I'm, I'm very into pop music. So I'm already kind of there in that sense of like 
Backstreet Boys. I've, I've shared on the podcast before, if it was popular between 1997 and 2005, that's my era. So Spice Girls, um, uh, Backstreet Boys, Bare Naked Ladies. I just, I like really poppy stuff. I think EXO is always a safe choice. They're a boy group. Um, they have been around since the early 2010s. And they have some more hard hitting stuff, but then they do these little like retro throwbacks that have, you know, disco swing and like electro swing, which is really fun. And it's just so catchy. And there's so many of them. There's nine members right now. Um, and th- there were 12 at one point, there are now nine. Um, but there, because you have so many members, one thing about K-pop is that you have these beautiful harmonies because every single one of them can sing and they, there's just so many layers. So I, I really recommend EXO. I'm, uh, I will definitely, definitely be checking them out and uh, letting you know what I'm probably obsessed with because that's my personality, so. Yeah. So I'm going to throw a little wrench in here with my musical tastes. So really enjoy rock. Classic rock is my favorite to listen to. Um, I do enjoy, uh, do enjoy some hip hop. And um, I also like 70s pop music as well. So what could you recommend with my interesting musical tastes there is a company called yg who has two different groups that kind of originated from the same competition like reality show kind of a mix of like very like poppy fun to listen to rap music and then a little bit like harder hitting rap music so i think either winner or icon might be a good fit for you from the era that i started listening to k-pop music in you were very familiar with probably like three, maybe like four or five, like major uh, entertainment companies. And so when Caroline started talking about her musical preferences, I was like, oh, so you'd be like an SM entertainment kind of person because Carol talked about EXO. I was thinking maybe Red Velvet, maybe Girls' Generation. And then when Bryce started talking about his musical preferences, I was like, maybe more YG for you. (laughs) You categorize people into like the production companies that produce these different groups because that is sometimes very indicative of their style. Learning so much today. (laughs) I I think we're going to have to report back on in a future uh, (laughs) uh, podcast episode about our uh, musical journey with this. I think. Yeah. So uh, before we get to our roundtable questions, Bryce, can you share with listeners what we'll be talking about on our next episode, which is coming out on April 22nd, 2022. Yeah, so today we've talked a little bit about our current March Madness Best of the 90s tournament. Uh, When you hear this episode, of course it's done. You know who the winner is. But as we record this today, we don't know who the winner is. So on our next episode, we're going to be doing a deep dive and talk all about who the winner was. Uh, Right now, it could be about the Spice Girls. It could be about the book Jurassic Park. It could be about Seinfeld, who I'm pulling for. Uh, It could be about the movie Home Alone. Who knows? So uh, tune in on uh, April 22nd as uh, we do a deep dive into uh, this year's March Madness winner. Uh, Caroline, I have to ask you, who do you hope we're going to be talking about on April 22nd? I I don't even know anymore, honestly. Like with everything, <laughs> I think I'm pretty much knocked out altogether in all of the categories. Um, uh, Lion King would be fun to talk about. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I just, I, I feel good. Home Alone, I, we've talked in the past. What is keeping me from being kind of freaked out about the idea of doing a deep dive into something is knowing that any of the ones that are remaining, I have a pretty good idea of them anyway. It's not nice. like I'd have to start with like season one of something. <laughs> yeah, I have a feeling it's going to be Lion King that we're going to be talking about, but uh, I'm hoping hoping it's Seinfeld. Love to do a Seinfeld episode of the podcast. So sure. I'll have to do zero research because, yeah, know that show like the back of my hand. So, yeah, let's move into our quick roundtable questions here. Uh, Carol, 
if you could create a collaboration between any musical artist and a K-pop artist, what would it be? So I cheated on this a little bit because for the musical artist, I picked a pair and that would be Billie Eilish and Phineas. And I want them to do a collaboration with Actong Musician. Uh, Actong Musician is a brother sister K-pop duo slash K-indie a little bit. Um, and they're, they write and produce all of their own music and they're signed to a big group, uh, or sorry, they're signed to a big company, which is surprising a little bit, but they have such an expansive sound and they cover all different genres. So I thought it'd be the ultimate sibling collaboration. Uh, Maria, how about you? There are a couple of absolutely phenomenal female uh, solo artists that I love to listen to in K-pop. And one of them is from a group, a girl group that was called Sistar that have since disbanded. Um, but Hyo, Hyo Rin, or Hyo Lin, um, is an incredible singer, incredible dancer. I feel like she has like amazing stage appeal and her mixed with Dua Lipa or any other kind of like big ticket uh, North American female solo artist would make for a great collaboration. Nice. Caroline, uh, who are you? Uh, who would you like to see collab? Well, I, I need some help with this. So hopefully we can, we can group work this answer uh, workshop it a little bit. I think I may have been stuck in the March Madness mindset because here's my vision. I think having uh, Shania Twain and someone come up with the ultimate wedding dance first dance ballad song who should pair with shania twain uh on like a romantic ballad taeyun what do you think carol i was thinking taeyun or crush oh yeah but i think taeyun's voice would pair better with shania twain Tayan is the lead singer from Girls' Generation. I I think I I like this idea. Then that thank you very much for uh, helping me out with that answer. Yeah, I think for mine, um, I was thinking about this, and of course, I went with the obvious. Like mine would involve BTS mostly because that's the group I'm most familiar with. And I talked about enjoy rock, so I thought a collaboration between like. BTS with and the Foo Fighters, like some epic like rock anthem. There'd be some cool dancing to it. And I think it would be a really neat music video as well. So uh that's that's the one I would really like to see. And actually it's funny because uh before we recorded today, I noticed on Twitter it was announced that BTS is gonna be doing a collaboration with Snoop Dogg. So yeah. Oh Maria, I just broke some news to you. <laughs> that would be hilarious i cannot yeah, it, wait for that apparently it's coming so yeah keep your uh keep your eyes open for that one all right uh so before we recorded today uh we sent a link out uh caroline found this link and basically it's a buzzfeed quiz where uh it tells you which k-pop girl group it asks you which k-pop girl group do you belong in uh i know we've all done the quiz uh maria i'm gonna start with you uh which girl group are you a part of it seems to pair very well with what i've been talking about today that i am apparently going to be the next member of twice <laughs> there so go. they're gonna become a 10 person girl group now <laughs> uh carol how about you i got red velvet um, and I love Red Velvet. They do really poppy, fun things, but they also have their Velvet side, which has, you know, a little bit darker, more R&B inspired. I think it's a great, um, it's just a beautiful pairing and Red Velvet is so tasty anyways. So I'm just super excited to be the sixth member of Red Velvet. <laughs> nice. Is that the group you would have picked or would have you picked something else? Um, I might've picked... A different group and i'll i'll let the two of you share and i'll chime in okay caroline uh what's uh which group for you 
Well, it's now going to be an 11 person group because I also got twice. So uh, this will work out really well. Uh, I think Maria can show me the ropes. So uh, I, I like I like where this is headed. Bryce, which group are you in? I know I'm going to be the first male member of the group Mama Moo. I'm excited about it. <laughs> I think I would be the is it the fifth? Would I be the fifth member? Okay, that's right. Perfect. Yeah. So watched a couple of their music videos. They're like, like uh, I think Carol, you mentioned before, Maria, the production values on all these videos are just absolutely incredible. And yeah, I, I mean, like I said, I'm not, it's not a genre of music I really can get into, but yeah, if you just throw on some, uh, some K pop videos, they're visually, they're all stunning and uh, just, absolutely uh um uh incredible to watch so i'm looking forward to being the fifth member of mama moo so watch yeah. for that one i would have Carol picked mama moo oh really <laughs> yeah That's because funny. they're they're so good at singing and moonbeal has four dogs so i i am a hundred percent on board with that Thanks. every single one of the members of that group can sing like nobody's business. They're incredible. Carol, Maria, thank you both so much for joining us today. It's been such a great day for us to uh, learn all about K-pop. And I think our listeners too will have uh, hopefully learned um, something new or more about that uh, musical area. Is there anything before we go, is there anything you'd like to let our listeners know about anything coming up at EPL? Maria? So by the time this episode comes out, and I'm crossing my fingers so that this doesn't get jinxed, we're back to in-person programming, which is so exciting. So if you are ever nearby the Children's Library, I want to bring your kiddos over for a program. Maybe you'll see me there. And also, that also means that the Lit Vans are back out on the road and we're doing visits to communities in and around Edmonton. So if you're curious about what we do, then check out the EPL website and all of our visits and site information will be up there. Great. We'll have a link to information about the Shelley Milner Children's Library, as well as the Lit Van information and schedule uh, linked in our show notes today. Carol, is there anything you want people to know that's coming up? Yeah, I have two things um, to mention that are happening in April. So one is called One E-Read Canada, and the other is called Big Library Read. So One E-Read Canada is a digital bilingual across Canada book club. And this year we're reading The Break by Katerina Vermette. It is a fiction novel about a Métis community in Northern Winnipeg. So you can get instant access to The Break uh, from April 1st to April 30th and keep an eye out for our digital book club meetup at the very end of the month. The other book club that is happening is called Big Library Read. It's from Overdrive and it runs from April 4th to April 18th. Uh, on Overdrive and Libby, you can get instant access to Music is History by Questlove. So if you're a fan of American pop culture and pop music from the 1970s onwards, this might be the book for you. Yeah, I'm definitely going to be borrowing that one. Uh, I've heard of it. I have not read it yet, but uh, yeah, I'll definitely be uh, checking that out here in, in early April. And I'm really excited to hear what uh, people think of The Break. Uh, I've read that and really looking forward to some of the discussions that will come from uh, all of Canada taking a look at that, that book. So we hope you've enjoyed today's episode. If you haven't done so, we encourage you to subscribe so that you automatically get all of our new episodes. Please also leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. And please also tell a friend about the show. Don't forget that we'll have a link to everything that we talked about in today's show notes. So that there's going to be lots of links to some amazing uh, music that you can uh, borrow from us or listen to online. And if, as usual, we would love to hear from our listeners and you can reach us on twitter at epl.ca and use the hashtag epl overdue fines you can also email us at podcast at epl.ca thank you for listening and we'll see you next time 